So thanks very much everybody for being here for the Syracuse Center of Excellence Research and Technology Forum. I'm Tammy Rossanio, the Associate Director for Partner Programs here at Syracuse COE, and we're very glad you're here. The Research and Technology Forum series is brought to you by the Syracuse COE Partner Program. If there's anybody here or on the webinar uh, joining us this afternoon who's not a member of the Partner Program, we would welcome that conversation with you and um, encourage you to reach out to me to have, uh, to have a chat. So um, I am not Professor Bing Dong, who was scheduled to be our moderator and really looking forward to be our moderator today. Professor Dong is a new faculty member at Syracuse University in the College of Engineering, Mechanical Engineering, um, doing some research in battery systems. And uh, he had a family situation, a family emergency, and so he's not able to be here. We do look forward to hosting him as a presenter at a future R&T forum. Um, to hear a little bit more about both the work that he's doing at Syracuse University and the research that he's doing there, as well as the company that he's bringing to Syracuse from Austin, Texas to, um, to build and grow. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, our presenter, uh, Hugh Henderson. Hugh is, um, this is such a pleasure because Hugh is such a longtime collaborator and friend of the Center of Excellence. I think since the beginning, yeah. pretty close to yeah. the beginning. <laughs> so Hugh has worked with Syracuse COE staff and faculty and on many projects over the years. And we're always thrilled to find new opportunities to work together. Hugh is a principal consultant at Frontier Energy with more than 30 years of experience evaluating energy technologies through on-site evaluation, field monitoring and energy simulations. His area, Areas of expertise include innovative HVAC systems, CHP, industrial processes, and heat recovery. Hugh holds both bachelor's and master's degrees in agricultural engineering, which I think is pretty closely tied to mechanical engineering at Cornell University. He's a professional engineer in Florida and New York State and an active member in several ASHRAE society level committees. Please join me in welcoming Hugh Henderson as our presenter today at the Syracuse COE Research and Technology Forum. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, and so speaking of Ashray, I had given this come more close microphone work. Okay. You, you think it's we're actually uh, just for uh, the web? It's for the web mostly. Okay. okay. So I'll now I can hear. Yeah. yeah, okay. So it's yeah. So so this presentation is a is a variant on what I gave in Ashray actually the first year, and so and so that's why Ed had been in the audience actually, and he suggested it would, it would be a good topic for here as well. Um, just a thing about Frontier. Frontier, we're based in Casanova, and we also were 170 people, 130 people in California, Texas, and New York State, and 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 so we have the New York office in Casanova here. Um, so what I want to talk, to talk to you today is about CHP or combined heat and power systems. And there's, and it turns out that NYSERDA has a portfolio that they have incentivized across the year. Here's and I want to talk about kind of what we've seen across this fleet of CHP systems and the impact that monitoring and recommissioning had on their performance. Um, so to start with, you know, CHP, what, you know, what is it? It's combined heat and power. In the past, it's also been called cogeneration. Um, and it's also called distributed generation. More, more recently, it's called distributed energy resources because they wanted to make room for batteries or storage in the mix. And, and so really, CHP, from our point of view, it saves energy. And it makes and it makes facilities more resilient. It provides backup power when the utility is not there. Um, and the reason you would do CHP, there we go. So the reason that, that that sites do CHP is ultimately to save money and to save resources and and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. A traditional um, system or where where you have a power plant and then you have a boiler. Um, at a building, um, CHP is one system that replaces both of those things. So 
where, where a power plant makes power and there's some waste heat that gets thrown away at the power plant, the idea of CHP is to bring that power plant to the building and you make power and, 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 and then the, the uh, heat from the process can, can be beneficially applied uh, to, to meet loads in the building. And one of my favorite sayings is, is really, and so there's, there's, and so we always call it waste heat, but really what we want is we want to have a system on site that makes electricity and thermal that can be beneficially used in the building. And I always say that CHP, I don't care about the engine and what color it is and how shiny it is. To me, CHP is about the building. If the CHP system makes heat and the building can't, can't use the heat, then it was all for naught. So, so really CHP is all about matching machines to buildings and matching equipment to buildings. Um, so I put this slide in just because of our modern times, you know, so CHP, it uses fossil fuels and they are evil or, or the argument is this sometimes goes in some, in some circles. And the answer is yes, they do use fossil fuel, but they use it more efficiently. And so, and so you still get greenhouse gas savings from compared to what you're doing now. So I think, and I think, you know, one thing I think people envision that the grid's going to be hundred percent renewable and then, and then things like heat pumps are going to make sense and, and going to be the best answer. But I think we're not, we're not quite there yet. And, and so it's true that, that the grid is becoming more, more, more based on renewable sources of energy, but we're not there. And in the meantime, CHP can be an incremental way to, to save costs for a site and save, and so reduce greenhouse gases on, an, on a societal level too. And so, so I think it's still part of the solution. It's, 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 it's part of the solution for the grid. And I think, you know, one thing, and batteries are speeding electrification of the grid. And, re and renewables benefit from batteries. But I also like to make the, make the point that a lot of things are gonna benefit from batteries. Actually, batteries can make a CHP system more efficient. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more at the end. Um, and again, so, and, and I think that yes, heat pumps, you know, once the grid is becoming renewable and, and in New York state, there's a lot of interest in heat pumps and I'm involved in a lot of that work. And I think it is, it, it is coming and it's, and it's valid. But the interesting point that I like to make, make is that some of the building applications where CHP makes the most sense are also the applications where it's gonna be hard to apply a heat pump. And maybe the best example, CHP makes a lot of sense in a multifamily building where, where, where the heat goes to, to meet the domestic hot water load and then and the power gets used inside the building. Um, and there's not an immediate, at the moment, there's not really a heat pump based solution to those sorts of things. So, so I think the way to think of CHP is it still works best in the places that there is no heat pump based solution yet. And I think, and it's sort of a bridge to, to you know, to the future. So, um, so I think there's still a role, you know, so, so CHP, it does still consume fossil fuels. And if you think fossil, if you think we shouldn't be consuming them, I say we should always be consuming less fossil fuels. And this is part of, part, part of the solution to getting there. Um, so NYSERDA has had a CHP program since 2000. And there's been incentives. At first, it was kind of a demonstration program where innovative systems were kind of funded on a, on a custom basis. Um, and the best proposals were accepted and novel concepts were encouraged. About seven years ago, they went to a program that was more, but more a subscription program. And it, it was called the catalog program where, where, where certain systems had been approved. And, and if you could meet all the requirements, you could get funding to do that. And, and it was based, I think rightly it was, and so this, and so the whole program was sort of based on the concept that vendors can have pre-approved packages or packages that are known to work. And the incentives were actually through the vendors. And, and one of the key things that we saw in the demonstration program and they sort of saw was there was a lot of finger pointing in CHP systems. And, and, um, and so, so one way to sort of eliminate that is to have 
one person take bumper to bumper responsibility. And so the program was sort of aimed at the vendor. And this was, the, and, and, and this is admittedly more for, for small CHP systems. For, for big CHP systems, you still need an engineering firm, right, Mike? And you have to, and, and they have to be engineered, designed, and, and, and put in. But there's this in between area where, where maybe, engine, maybe it doesn't have to be an engineering driven project, it could be a vendor driven project. So NYSERDA had focused on that. And then the other thing that, you know, so through all this process, NYSERDA was collecting data on the performance of, the C, of these CHP systems. And we've kind of been involved. We, we monitored, uh, so Frontier, then CDH actually monitored the first C, CHP system in 2002 or 2003. So we've kind of been involved from the beginning. Um, and, and so one thing that I sort of started in 2016 is this concept of, of kind of more quality control and, and recommissioning of systems. So, so what I sort of saw is systems got designed and they got built and they were, were not meeting expectations. They were not living up to their potential. So the whole idea of an, about an inspection program and a recommissioning program is to make sure each system is installed the way it was supposed to be and use the data that, that gets collected on these systems to, 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 to see how the system was working and see if there might be slight small improvements that can be made. Um, and, and by improvements, we're, and so by recommissioning, and so, so I sometimes say retro commissioning, that's, that actually means something else. We mean recommissioning, meaning, because in theory, these systems were, you know, whatever commissioning means, in, in theory, something was done up front to make them work right. We, but, but usually that's done without much data. Our advantage is we have, we have a great source of performance data, so we can look back at historic performance and look at how things were set. And, and so often what we find, and I'll show you this in a couple of ways, is that it's not major capital improvements are needed. It's tiny adjustments and changes to set points and things like that that are needed in some cases. So, um, and here's, yeah, so, so, so CHP systems from the beginning were always required to submit performance data to NYSERDA. And so what this often meant is data collected at 15 minute intervals and, and we wanted the power output from the system. We wanted the fuel input to the system and we wanted the useful heating delivered to the building. Not the heat available from the machine, but the heat that could be used by the building. And then we had other points. We, we often, in some sites, we actually could see what the load for the building was and, and what it was still importing from the grid. And we also could look and maybe some of the heat didn't get used, so it got rejected. We would measure that. Um, and, so, and so in the beginning, even performance data uh, so at some points in the program, performance data was the basis for the incentive payment by NYSERDA. And so, and of course that, that made the person doing the monitoring awfully, you know, that, that made us the lightning rod in many cases when we're standing between people, people's money and, uh, and uh, but you know, so, so, and it's also kind of a cumbersome process. So NYSERDA really moved away from that and, but they still wanted data collection, but, but payments are not necessarily tied to data collection. Um, and in the bottom line, after doing this for, for 15, you know, 15 years going, going on 20 years, we now have a pretty large data set. Um, and actually, so, and I'll talk about, um, and so, so what we've done, so Frontier actually has run a website that has all this data for several years. Um, and so this is, and on that website, there's actually a map of where all the, C, all the CHP systems are. It turns out this, so this is a DER website for NYSERDA now. So it has, it actually has farm digesters, it has CHP systems, it has fuel cells in, in building applications and solar PV, and it has energy storage, though we don't have any performance data yet on the energy storage systems. Um, and this is just a map of where all those CHP systems are. And I, I really just put this map up to show they're all in New York City, right? So there's, so the majority 
of the market for this has been in New York, and that's because of pricing in New York City, and it's because of the types of buildings in New York City. Here's kind of a similar map, but it shows where the big systems are. So the size of the circle is the size of the system. And so, so you see the one at Cornell that's actually no longer working is, is a huge, huge bubble here. That's the biggest system upstate. There are some similar big systems downstate, but um, so you can see, and so the portfolio of systems ranges from small systems as far small as 35 kW up to 30 and 50 kW systems. So, so, um, so, so data and the process of recommissioning has really helped to make CHP better and make it live up to expectations. And, and I think this, is, this has been especially true on some of the smaller systems. And what we find is the big systems, there's the big system at St. Joe's, so backing up. Um, so the biggest system in Syracuse is St. Joe's. That's the, that's the biggest one there. Um, those systems generally do better because they're getting a lot more attention. When you get a 100 kW system or even a 500 kW system, that's where there's less attention being paid to how it's working, and some of the and and and, so, and so, some of the, the 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 design decisions and the control decisions can have a big impact. And um, and like I said, so having interval data, um, it allows us to kind of confirm the system works, or if it's and it's working as expected, or it allows us to identify any issues and and correct them. And, and, so, um, and so, so the RCX process combines using that 15 minute interval data or that performance data um, and going on site. And, and so the combination of those two to allow us to, to see how the system's working. And you know, so since the beginning, every CHP design has a pro forma or a feasibility study, and they all say, they're going to be. They're going to have a CHP efficiency, which is the power provided plus the heat provided divided by the fuel input. And so, for so since 2000, it's been known that a system that can be over 60 percent across the year is a good system. Every system is. Every system was designed to be 60 percent. They just weren't all 60 percent once they were built. Um, and I think what what I think this whole process has helped helped to do. So expectations. So everyone always had expectations that were pretty high, and so so what RCX helps you do is to realize your expectations. Um, and, and this is just talking about. And, and I think I've covered all this. That's just the process. Um, and this is yeah. I jumped ahead a little bit. So so in the beginning to get to get funded, you had to have. You had to you had to have a design CHP efficiency over over fifty five percent, and the, and if you were over sixty percent, and if you were under uh, under fifty five percent on a high, higher heating value basis for the fuel, then you actually would start to lose incentive. Um, and so so what we what we found is we 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 kind of found some safe harbor sizing rules that we knew if you had a multifamily building and you had 100, 100 apartments, that if you were this size, odds are you were gonna be pretty good. So what we did for small, what I sort of did for smaller systems is they set up safe harbor rules where if you met some simple rule, very coarse rules of thumb, you did not have to have a full analysis to show that your design was going to reach 60% fuel conversion efficiency. Um, and so what we, and, and I think that's generally been pretty safe. And then, so we still allow engineers to, you know, so these rules of thumb are admittedly very coarse. It's just, we're pretty certain you're gonna perform if you're in this range. Systems could be, could have different sizing and different arrangements and still be okay. But then you have to provide more, more details about, about your design in, in a feasibility study. And what we saw is that, is that as, you know, 
So in the beginning, everyone promised 60%. No one got it in the first five years. And lately in 2016, you know, here's some of the numbers in 2016 and 2017. So based on the inspections and a quick look at the data, more and more systems are realizing what everybody always expects. Um, and the other, so the other metric that's I'm, that I'm going to talk about is so 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 you want to be efficient, and it turns out to have greenhouse gas savings in New York State, you have to be approximately above sixty percent fuel conversion efficiency on a higher heating value basis. Um, does everyone know what I mean by a higher heating value basis? Should I? So yeah. no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. So, so when you buy fuel, when you buy natural gas, you, 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 you buy it on a per therm basis and a therm is 100,000 uh, BTUs, but on a higher heating value basis. Um, you also can think if you don't, and that's if you condense all the moisture out of the exhaust stream. Another way to look at it um, is that, well, maybe you shouldn't, maybe there was no need to to condense the water out of the exhaust stream. Some systems, that's not a natural thing to do. Turns out a condensing furnace, that's what it does. Um, but the bottom line is you pay for fuel on a higher heating value basis, but many engine manufacturers rate their equipment on a lower heating value basis. So if something, and there's about a 10% difference. So if someone tells you their system is 30%, has a 30% electrical efficiency, on an LHV basis, that means that if you do it on the basis of the fuel you buy, therms, it's only, it's going to be 10% less. It's only going to be 27%. So one thing, and there's been a lot of confusion across the years. And, but the bottom line is, I, at this point, can always say the only basis that makes any sense is the basis I buy the fuel on and I'm buying it. And it says uh, buying a therm it has a hundred thousand BTUs on a, higher heating value basis. So why are we ever talking about efficiencies that are on a, on a basis that's 10% less, so the efficiency is inflated 10%. So, um, but anyway, so that's why I always say HHV. I say it out of habit because across the years, this has been confusing. Now I think there's pretty much consensus that, that um, well, I'm gonna just go to the grave saying it, but, but, but but you always should ask somebody when they when when when, when they tell you the efficiency uh, of a system, you, you should ask if it's on an HHV or an LHV basis. Um, so the other factor that's pretty important that we see in the field um, is is how much you know. So the system is 100 kW, and and if it puts 100 if it puts 100 kW out for 87 60 hours of the year that would be a 100% capacity factor because of various reasons, systems often run less than that. Maybe it's derated at different temperatures. Maybe it shuts off because there's no thermal load. Um, and there could be other reasons. But so one, um, one other important metric is the capacity factor. And so I want to, so here, here is a snapshot from the website that is our kind of high level view, view of a CHP system. So. So we always, so if we have a given system and I'm showing you Albany Medical Center, it's about a four and a half megawatt turbine and then steam. So across the year, across this period, the average electrical efficiency was 31%, which is good. So it shows it's green. Our, our thermal efficiency, the, the percent of the fuel that goes into heat was 46. So our combined efficiency is 68%. And, the, and so these are all very good numbers. And on top of that, its capacity factor was 79%. So it ran at, at full speed a large majority of the time. Um, and so, so on the website, we have a green, yellow, orange kind of color coding. And so in this case, and we have kind of thresholds for those colors, but this is an example of a very good system that was had good efficiency and had a good capacity factor. One thing we find is you can have systems, so if you control it to match the thermal loads, you can have a good efficiency, but you have a poor capacity factor, which means you spent money on something and you didn't use it 
to the fullest extent for a for a for a combined heat and power system to be cost effective if you if you spend the money for a 100 kW unit you would like it to put out 100 kW all the time or as much of the time as possible um, so these are kind of our key metrics that kind of define how well how well a CHP system works so those are and really there's three cuz thermal efficiency CHP efficiency is thermal efficiency plus electric efficiency. So that's why this plus this adds to that. So, 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 the, so the metrics we care about is, it, it is because electricity is valuable, you'd like that number to be as high as possible. 31 is pretty good. You'd like the CHP efficiency to also be good. That means you're using lots of heat and you'd like it to run all the time. That's the capacity. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So 79% um, is in the green range. What's yeah. the point at which it goes down to yellow or sixty percent for capacity factor? Sixty percent. So we like it to be above sixty yeah. percent. Well, th these are sort of arbitrary ranges we've decided. Um, and the, and that electrical efficiency, it depends on the size a little bit, but I believe the threshold would be 30 for this size, this size unit. Um, So, so one feature of the website is now we have the, so, so this is the, this website right here that you can, you can go to that, that we run for NYSERDA. So, so the big improvement about a year and a half ago is we have this benchmarking feature where you can compare something to its peer. So we've been looking at Albany Medical Center and, and we're comparing it to all its peers, which happen to be large hospitals. And there are seven, there are seven peers in this particular group. And you can see that, you know, so, 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 and so what we're looking at now is CHP efficiency. So it wasn't the best system we saw, but it was better, but, but it was in the top half. And the average for it, the average was about 60% in this for these systems. And this system was just a little better. And the top peer is actually 75% or 76%, which is very good. And so we have this ability. And so, so I should talk about, you know, so CHP, it, the first place that ever made sense, even what was called cogeneration, was hospitals. Um, for smaller systems, I think the, probably the next, so, so the next most popular category we have is, is we, have, um, we have a lot of multifamily sites too. Um, so, so I went by the slide quickly, but in our database, I'm going to go back to slide um, so in our database, we have 191 systems that have data, and there's about 100 systems that sent us data in September. So, so, this, so, so the difference between those are the ones that have stopped sending us data, that, that, have, that no longer have a contractual requirement to do it or have stopped for a reason. I would say half of our CHP systems that we're monitoring are multi. So multifamily is probably the next biggest category. I never showed the slide for that one because it, it, it's too tall. It goes off the page because there's, there's 70. Um, so, and here's kind of another way to think about, think about the useful metrics to understand. This is getting at some of the things that I was talking about. So here is the capacity factor on the x-axis. Here is the, fuel conversion efficiency in higher heating value or the or the chp efficiency and so we have dotted lines and the different symbols are different vendors and i'm not going to show you that to protect the guilty um and so uh because we're not trying to make anybody look bad we're just you know but we are always looking at how different people perform but so the and the dotted lines are the thresholds that we consider Good. And so, so the blue, the blue dots happen to have a control strategy where they only run when there's a thermal load. So that guarantees they have a high fuel conversion efficiency, but in some cases they have a very low capacity factor, some of their sites. So this quadrant is sort of an ideal place you'd like to be. If you're in this quadrant, it means you're efficient, but you don't run very much. 
and in this and in this one, sorry, in this cat in this in this uh, in this quadrant down here, you run a lot, but maybe your efficiency is low. Um, and so, of course, if you're down here, you're just bad. So this is the, this is so I would think if you want color coding, this is the red quadrant. These are the yellow quadrants, and this is the green quadrant. If you want to do it in the color, but I think you know. So, so there is this concept: is you can operate the CHP system so that you maximize efficiency, or that you maximize the kilowatt hours you generate, or and really, from a given site point of view, what you'd really like to do is probably maximize the the uh, the uh, um, the. Uh, um, dollars that you make from the site, though from a greenhouse gas point of view, the higher you are in CHP efficiency, the better you're doing at, at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, okay, so now I want to shift gears. So from the RCX process, so that was kind of a portfolio view. So now I want to talk about some of the problems that we've seen at, at some of the sites that, that we've looked at. And so, and, and you know, so, and so technical issues. So we have technical issues and kind of economic issues. And so our number one problem we find are just control detail. There's, there's minor control settings and design details that don't let the heat get into the building. So a control detail might be a set point controller on a pump, might not, might not let the, you know, the, or, so if the building loop runs hotter at a higher temperature than the loop of the CHP system, no heat can ever get transferred. And if you can lower the building temperature, and sometimes the building temperature is high just, just for habit or, or some unknown reason, sometimes it has to be that way. But if you can just lower a certain set point, heat might start to flow and you can use it better. And an example of design detail, maybe that heat exchanger was not sized to meet the load and it wouldn't let enough heat from the cogeneration system through to the building system. And those are kind of examples. That's probably our most, those two things are probably the most common problem we found. And obviously things that are control settings are relatively easy to fix. Um, and then, but sometimes design details it still can be worth it to fix those and, and, it, and it can make sense to do that. Um, and then the other, the other actually, the other thing that we see is so every system that we see um, makes less electricity than the pro forma predicted. And it makes less, less, less electricity often because the building is required to have an import set point so that it always draws a little power from the utility and that ensures there's no reverse power being sent out to the utility. People don't take that into account in the, in the design. Um, the other thing that, that, that we've seen happen is, is that people don't realize there's multiple, you're in a building and there's multiple, you've got a total bill, but there's multiple services. A CHP system can only serve one electric service and be behind one meter. It can't be behind both. Um, and the other thing that we find a lot is that almost every, some systems are worse than others, but every system is more efficient at full load than is a part load. There are certain kinds of systems that it's really true, and a micro turbine is an example of one that really does not like to run at part load. Um, so the other kind of issues we see is that in a pro forma, people often look at the electricity you produce and they assume they take the average cost of electricity in the building and they assume that that's what you're going to save. In reality, when you're displacing electricity in the use, there's, there's, you're going to that marginal rate of electricity for, for displaced use is gonna be on the order of 80 to 90% of the average use. And the reason is there's fixed charges in the bills that don't go away. Maybe there's energy reduction, but there's not demand reduction. So the demand charges. So anyway, so people often, so you have to, so when people do a CHP analysis and do a prediction of savings, you never should use the average cost of electricity in the building. You should do the marginal, the marginal 
costs or, or, or the marginal savings of reducing electricity and building an imported glass. Something we often see too is that, you know, people always assume that, that there's a maintenance cost to operating a CHP system. It's on the order of two cents a kilowatt hour. But if those charges are fixed and you only pay a certain amount per year, and that, that fixed amount is based on some, some production goal that you never met, then you're also paying a lot more for maintenance than you ever thought. Um, and so these are kind of the big picture things. Now what I'd like to do is get into a case study um, and show you and, and talk about uh, what we saw, or, or, or that's right, I forgot. So, so and here's kind of some graphical information on, on what, we, so, so this is in the first year, we had gone through this RCX process on 10 sites and it shows, and the different colors are the different vendors or pieces of equipment. So I'm not gonna talk about those, but you can see that just like I said, that, that thermal load and heat exchange is one of the biggest problems. One thing that, that, is, that I didn't mention is that problems on the monitoring system were always a problem. And, and so sometimes, and, and also our company, at some sites we did the monitoring, at some sites we did not do the monitoring. So, so we often get the data. And, and I'm, I'm sad to say that we had some of the problems at sites we were responsible for too, but there were also some at the other sites that we were not responsible. So, so again, it's pretty hard to get instrumentation. Well, it's easy to get instrumentation installed. It's hard to get the right information, the right and accurate information coming out of it. That, 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 that's why I always tell the contractor who's hitting my meter with a hammer and I ask him to please stop because, yeah, so it's easy to get something installed. It's hard to get installed and have it still work after you hit it with a hammer. So, um, you know, so it's very delicate and it's hard to set up and it's, and it's hard to get everything right. So that was actually our number one issue that we saw. But the other problems were low electrical load, lower meeting less, providing less power than was expected. The other thing was the thermal heat exchange. And then, and then the other thing was kind of shut down and trip out issues. And so now we've kind of, and so now we've done it over three years, we've done it at 28 sites and really nothing's changed too much except for we actually, so the one thing we did, we broke out thermal issues that were control issues and heat exchanger issues. So actually design or heat exchanger issues are actually bigger than control issues now. So, so control issues, having a set point that, that, that was set wrong and not letting the building accept the heat is, is second to having bottlenecks or, or low flow or a heat exchanger uh, problem that limits things. We still see lots of low load and we still see lots of monitoring. Um, and some of the ones, yeah, and, and the, other, the other bar over here is the operating schedule where, where the building, where the operating schedule was kind of l less than people expected when the building was out or already put together. So now, um, so now I just wanna talk about one building. So I wanna give an example of what we went through at one building. So this is a multifamily building in New York City. This 168th Street, never noticed that. Um, and so this has, this is a multifamily building. And the unusual thing about this is it had multiple electric services. So, and so whenever you put CHP in a, in a multifamily building, for it to make sense, it obviously has to be master meter, meaning, meaning if the individual tenants have separate meters, then the electrical load is gonna be way too small to make CHP make sense. So all of these buildings by definition were, were master metered. This one just happened to have a lot of electric services that, that it wasn't necessarily apparent at first. So what was installed it was a 65 kW microturbine and the electricity was to serve, um, okay, so this way for, it, was to, it was to serve the house account. Um, and I, I, and I guess there was other facilities in this building to make, a, make it, uh, to make it a larger load. This was a black start capable unit. So, so if the power went down, the idea was 
was that this could serve, make enough power to power at least one elevator and keep the common areas going. They cannot export power to the grid. It had integrated heat recovery. And the whole idea was to, was to displace the DHW loads and the space heating loads on the boiler. Um, so it can make 160 to 180 degree water. And it was a natural gas fired system on the roof and the hot water piping had to go down to the basement. So, so long, fairly long run. Um, so there was, so, so that's not a heat exchanger, it's a hydraulic separator, which is a fancy word for a tank. Um, and, and there was a DH, and so there was a heat exchange uh, between the, this kind of, this kind of loop that had the boiler and the micro turbine. And, and there was, and this served the space heating loads, but also served, served, served the domestic hot water loads. Um, so the micro turbine, so here's, here's kind of, here's the micro from the back. There's the hot water piping coming off of it. It had pumps, obviously, and there was, <laughs> and there's always plumbing. There's always plumbing in these systems. And in this kind of application, you're really putting it in the boiler room. So it's, so it's being hooked in in the boiler room, which is, which is, which is pretty often limited in size. Um, the instrumentation, we installed the BTU meter, we measured power, there was a gas meter, um, and there was a flow meter uh, that, that's, that, that was part tied into the BTU meter as well. So we were measuring uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 the power in, or the power out, the fuel in, and the thermal out. Um, and this was not put in by us, this was put in by somebody else actually. And so th this is kind of our process in four steps. So we, first thing we do is we were collecting data on this and we, first thing we do is make sure it looks reasonable. And then we really can't, and, and, so, and to a certain extent, when we first get the data as the website operator, we actually have not been on site. So we actually, we always try to look at the data, but then sooner or later, when we haven't been on site, we have to go on site and see how the system's really configured, make sure the instrumentation is where it's supposed to be, and, uh, and, and look at all that, and, look at, and, and we also look at the operating temperatures on the DHW side of the heat exchangers and on the loop side of the heat exchangers. Um, and what we found at this site is, is that, that we actually found found several system changes we could make that had no, that, that had instant savings and no capital cost. And then there was some things that took a little longer and I'll talk about those. And so one thing, um, so I think one thing that we find is, you know, so, so in commissioning in general, you find problems and it's somebody else's job to fix them. So often it's an open <coughs> process. One thing we found, and one thing we found that it really took at this site is we had to sort of follow up. We, we could recommend changes and then, then we had to go see if people did them and if they didn't do them, find out why. Um, and so I think that this, so one problem with generalized commissioning is that, um, is that you're just recommending things that somebody else is doing and to a certain extent, and really in this process, it takes a little longer because there's not a construction team on site who can fix things instantly. So everything takes a little longer. And, and so you have to follow up and then basically prove that the change has had an impact. And if your idea didn't work, you have to adjust and try something else. So here's, so this system in 2014, so here's these same graphs, right? So the capacity factor was poor, it was yellow. The electrical efficiency, was very poor, and that's because um, so, so, so it turns out microturbines are less efficient than than engines and other technology in the size range. But if you run them apart load, they're very inefficient. They're not very efficient at all. So 16 is really kind of terrible. And here's the here's the 16, and here is here's showing the month the month variation and all that. Um, so, so the bottom line is this system was shutting down a lot. It was, I, and it was, it wasn't producing the power everybody expected, and it wasn't producing, it didn't have the efficiency everybody expected. And so, so, 
so, so, so we did it. We came on site for the first time in September, and we, we and we did this recommissioning process. And our main the things we found is that the utility import was that set point that difference was really set way conservatively, and so it really had to be lowered. And it really didn't have to be as conservatively set. And it turns out, if you think so, it says it says that it was set to 24, and 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 it got moved to 10. So you can think of it that is around the clock. So it's an around the clock amount of power that you're forcing to be delivered by the utility and not produced by the CHP system. Um, the other thing that we found is that the the, the that the electrical loads were, you know, that there was always, the, the, and, and I think what happened is there was always plans to rearrange, they had multiple electric services, they were going to rearrange loads, and a lot of that never happened. And then the other thing we found is, like I said, that the heat recovery, that the, that the set point on the turbines um, were, were set, were set so, were set too low and the boiler was set too high so that the boiler always won the battle of meeting the load. So the CHP system. So when I say set points, I mean, which system gets the first crack at meeting the load in this system there, there, there was a boiler. And so, so they, so, the, so there was problems with that. And so, so um, and so the heat recovery setting was raised up so that it could compete with the boiler. So in this case, we had to raise the, 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 the uh, setting from the CHP system so that it could compete with the boiler and provide heat to the building. Yeah. yeah. Quick question. Uh, Chris Kerr asked if, uh, if, the, if let's see, does the incidence of the occurrences vary strongly with the size of the installed system? Over all the problems we, yeah, so, so I think it probably does. I think with the sample we have, we probably have more small systems than big systems. So, so I think that, yes, I think it probably does. And, and many of these are under a megawatt. So really our sample of recommission systems are all under a megawatt. Um, so anyway, so here is, here is the electricity produced from the system and and here's where they started. And here's where we did the RCX study. And then it turns out it took them a while, but they kept adding load. Um, you know, so, 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 but they steadily added load to that service and they lowered the import set point. So in the different years, the system could finally deliver the electricity that was expected. And kind of the same thing on the efficiency side. So, so the RCX, here's what they were doing. Here's, this is CHP efficiency and HHP. Here's, we did the study, we made some recommendations. Finally, finally they changed the set points and, 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 and believed us and things got a little better. Um, and here's kind of that kind of snapshot view comparing 2014 on the left and 2017 on the right. So again, the capacity factor went up the electrical efficiency did a little better because it wasn't operating at such a low load condition and the CHP efficiency got better. And here they were importing about half of their electricity with the CHP system. Here it was down to about a third. So, and, and so it was, you know, so, so they could make more power. It was higher, higher efficiency and they increased the heat recovery. And they also ended up with more stable operation it turns out that they really did not have to make any capital changes to the to the CHP system. I believe they did rearrange electrical services in the, in to, to accomplish some of this. And really, here so an improved performance equals improved cost savings. So so here's kind of a summary of where the project was in 2014. They were saving so. So I always say combined heat and power is subtracting a, a big number from another big number and hoping the difference is positive. Because and in this case, it, it, and so in this case, they did have still have a positive number, but, but it was very low. We do see CHP systems where the savings are negative because it's performing so poorly. But you can see that 
with all these improvements in 2017, the savings went from $10,000 a year to $25,000 a year. And so really, it, it was really us. So we had to do the RCX study. And then we had to kind of continue to kind of convince people of what to do and the benefits of doing it and kind of proven that it could work here. So, um, so admittedly, this is a small CHP system. And, and I think the small ones do benefit the most from this process. Um, so just kind of a summary of, of, uh, of, of kind of things across the portfolio is that, you know, so the incentive programs at NYSERDA really have moved the market to, to consistently provide better systems. Some of the first systems we saw were, did not meet expectations. And I think it's partially the years of data collection. And actually now we have, um, you know, now we have, the, and so, so the, so every site that gets an ISORTA incentive has to send, send data to this website. And we have this benchmarking tool. So you can see now it's easier than ever to see how you're performing relative to your peers. And I think that sort of helps to motivate vendors and end users to ensure their systems are operating right. And I think, um, well, I mean, this, this sentence is a little self-serving as the third party, I'll admit it. But I think in general, I think you do need a third party that it's hard for, you know, so, so just like third party commissioning makes the most sense. I think third party RCX is really what makes the most sense. If it's your system and you're immersed in it, you might not see everything. And you're certainly not motivated to tell your owner what you did wrong. You are motivated to quietly make it better. And I think the other service that we provided here is by highlighting all the things that can go wrong. Now, at least people know what some of these issues are and, and can look for them. So, um, so we enjoyed being the third party and, and doing it. But I think in general, I think having a third party looking at this is, is, is pretty, pretty cost effective, at least from the point of view of somebody like uh, that NYSERDA, and I think in general, it sort of moves the market so that so that you may not need to do this in the future. So I wanted to add this one slide. So the future of CHP. So, so NYSERDA has actually stopped giving incentives on CHP, partially because of the move to renewable heating and cooling electrification. Um, but there is probably something, you know, so the concept that I think NYSERDA is looking at and I think makes a lot of resonates is this concept of CHP plus, basically CHP that's integrated with renewable energy and energy storage. And, and I think, you know, so, so just like renewables benefit from storage, having a system that has CHP can, can, be, can, can kind of minimize the size of the battery pack you need and, 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 and you may get more benefit for less cost by putting all three of these together. And I guess one analogy, and, and so like, I'm, you know, so CHB, some of these import issues, batteries can help to solve the import issue and allow a system to generate power right up to the demand of the building and maybe even past and you can store the energy. And so just as, so I think storage, and I just, my only point is that batteries or storage don't just benefit renewables. There's a lot of things that can benefit from storage. And my analogy is, many of you may have heard that in California, Title 24 is going to require all homes in 2020 to have a PV system installed. And I think this, and I view this policy as now there's, now there's incentive to put in the best possible air conditioner. And it's not really, it's, and the law is not, Title 24 is not really that photovoltaic that solar is required. It's that you have to be zero net energy. And so if you can show, it, it, so if you can put in better systems and make the energy use of your house smaller uh, uh, under all the title, title 24, then your solar system has to, can be smaller as well. So really this policy sort of drives, so from my point of view, I like this policy because it drives more efficient air conditioners, more efficient building envelopes. So, so it's driving 
And that may not have been the, the intention, but I like the fact that it's driving energy efficiency. And I think similarly, CHB really, will really benefit from the adoption of solar and batteries in the transition to a renewable grid. The grid now, I think I heard the number, it's 12% renewable across the country. And so we're still a long ways from being all renewable. And all kinds of funny technologies have started to make sense. Now, megawatt scale engines that, you know, lead, so there's technologies where now, now you can get an engine generator runs on natural gas that's, that's 10 megawatts. And they're amazingly approaching efficiencies of 50%. So that technology, and there's a, and there's a lot of penetration in the uti on the utility grid because these, these engines have the ability to ramp quickly and respond to changes in solar generation. So, so you know, so, so I think, in, and so that's my example of kind of integration, right? So it isn't as simple as solar collectors, storage, we're done. There's going to be a mix of technologies on the grid and distributed energy resources, both behind the customer meter and, and, and on, on the, the utility side. So, and I think CHP, if there, there's still going to be a role for CHP, even though it does use fossil fuels, it uses less fossil fuel in it, and it's getting us towards the overall goal of reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, thank you. Uh, happy to take any questions. And I should say, So I didn't, I didn't talk about my, my co-authors, really Adam Wahlberger and Dan Robb are the ones that did most of this work. I'm just the glory hound standing up here presenting. <laughs> Go ahead. You, uh, I was gonna ask you whether there was a commissioning function involved at all when the, this equipment was put in, but looking at the size of it, you know, my guess is probably not commissioning per se, but were you able to determine whether there was actually any kind of of testing, operational testing performed? So uh, uh, I know you've probably seen it. I've seen it. Equipment gets put in. Someone turns the on switch. The vendor turns the on switch and goes home. And you go back a year or two later uh, to look at it because it hasn't been working correctly from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's possibly a, a, a root cause. Cause a lot of these set points that you've been talking about, uh, maybe when it never set correctly to begin with for whatever reason, to give people the benefit of the doubt. But what, how much of that uh, were you able to determine? You know, was there any initial operations testing or was it uh, turn on the switch and, and we've done our job? Yeah, well, well, I, well, I think everyone claims to do some testing. And I think, <laughs> and I think that, um, and I think you're right on the larger megawatt scale systems, Albany Med Medical Center, St. Joe's, there is a formal commissioning process that probably was, was gone through and did help. And I would argue that, so, so I've always argued that, that actually performance monitoring, you know, commissioning is coming, conceiving of some funny test you can do and then, and then you do the funny test and you write on your clipboard all the things. Performance monitoring is you just turn it on and wait to see what happens. And almost, and I give the analogy that that formal commissioning is looking through a straw at something. And I have the big world, you know, I have a year of performance data to look at. And I can see all the same issues because I have a I have more detailed data over a longer period of time because everything happens across the year. So any problem presents itself usually. So I think, but you're right. And I, and, and I think this, that, so I think the, 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 the three, four megawatt systems are, are, are commissioned and those do work better. I think it's the systems in the middle, the 500 KW systems or the, or the, and, and, and even some of the megawatt systems that were not commissioned. They all, they all, Produce a commissioning document, and they all they all um, claim to have gone through commissioning. It's probably not what you and I think commissioning is. So we encourage questions from some of our students. Too. 
and also folks on the web. Thank you. Yeah. Did you, did you uh, notice uh, the the dashboard was available before and after, right? For the, mm -hmm. Do you notice a different difference in the the owners or operators? Did they pay more attention after they saw these improvements and savings? Maybe you don't know. Yeah. So I don't think it was the owner operator. So the the operator owner operator was a not for profit. You know, so they were kind of, it was a small system. They were kind of classically understaffed. Really, it was the vendor or the, the installer of the equipment who kind of had free reign on how it operated. So in this, in that building, the owner was, I would say, absent or uninvolved. Um, though they knew they were losing money and they didn't like the fact that, but their staff didn't, they didn't have any staff capable. Of, you know, this is a multifamily building with a boiler room. And it's a not-for-profit running multifamily, so you can imagine. So, what's the lesson in that scenario? You know, there's this uh, multifamily building in New York City, and they installed a system that, even with improvements, was still really underperforming. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? You know, what's the lesson? If they were to go back to the beginning, what might they or should they have done differently to, you know, create a system that performed better and better met their needs? Yeah, well, so I think in that building, they they made some upfront design errors too, and some, and maybe the answer is CHP wasn't a perfect fit for this building in some cases, so that that might have been it. Um, and I think in general, I guess we're just trying to point out all these things. So I always consider that controls, you know, controls are something that that classically fall in between the designers and the operators right no one really knows the control system can be set from 140 to 200 but nobody knows really where it should go and you won't know and you can't know at the design stage until you actually operate it right so so one problem is is that it that falls in the cracks between those two things question from uh the webinar how do you how do you size the chp compared to facility peak electric is there a recommended rule? Yeah, so I think in general, CHP is always sized more on thermal load. So it's always selected to meet the thermal load. And then you'd like, so it almost never is cost effective to make it meet the peak electrical load. You want it to meet sort of the average thermal load. And I think the, the rationale is that you have this piece of equipment you want it to run all the time, so you should size it so that it's running pretty close to full out almost all the time. I use some softener words there, but. <laughs> One more. Uh, do you expect that there will continue to be PHP installations in the absence of NYSERDA incentives, either statewide or in the New York City metro area? Yeah, so I think they are still, yes, I think that NYSERDA's program will start back up. And there are still CHP systems going in. We know of some that are still, so some projects are still going forward. So the NYSERDA incentive, you know, it's, so it certainly has slowed down installations, but it hasn't brought them to a halt. And uh, he would also like to know how many hotels installed systems through the NYSERDA program. And what can you say about the compatibility of CHP, CHP in hotels? Yeah, so hotels can be a pretty good can be a pretty good fit. And actually, one caveat: they can be a pretty good fit as long as they do laundry on site. So hotels that do laundry on site are generally a pretty good CHP fit. And we do have, I believe, there's probably 10, 10, CA, 10 hotels in the in the database at least that I can think of. Yeah, and I should say, so the good applications are where there's there's a need for thermal, and the need for thermal could be domestic hot water in a multifamily building. It could be, you know, and, and it turns out that for hospitals, if the hospital farms out its laundry, then it's sort of less, it's less interesting as a CHP application. So buildings that use lots of power and, and have thermal loads that coincide it happen at the same time, those are the best applications. So hotels or hospitals are the classic multifamily is our biggest, the, as the biggest numbers. And it probably has to be a multifamily over 
over 50, over 70 apartments, for it to make sense. That's why it's a New York market. There are only a couple of those in Syracuse. Um, and it, and the next day, and then specialty industrial laundries actually are, are a good application too. And industrial, of course. Industrial has always been, some of our sites are industrial, but the majority are probably commercial institutional. All right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it.